Well, folks, we're having problems with our equipment tonight, so we're not going to have the lead-in here. It's just something's not working. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. We're already beginning to see some people coming in for the conference beginning on Monday, folks. And uh, we know that we're going to be seeing more and more people as the weekend progresses. We expect quite a few to begin drifting in on Saturday and Sunday. And then, of course, the main body will show up for registration Monday morning between 8 and 10 a.m. By golly, I think I've got this straightened up just so all you purists won't be disappointed out there. We'll give you the lead in. And there you have it, just so that there's no mistake about what or who you're listening to. For those of you coming for the conference, we have what's called monsoons in Arizona at this time of year. That means the prevailing wind comes generally from the south, bringing tremendous amounts of moisture-laden warm air from Mexico. And just about every afternoon, we have a few thunderstorms drifting around. Sometimes they're just little sprinkles, and sometimes they are a demonstration of the power of Mother Nature. And make no mistake about it, she is very powerful. This afternoon, I was driving back from Sholo, and there was a torrential downpour, the likes of which I have not seen since the monsoons in Vietnam. And uh, with the windshield wipers on full speed, I literally could see nothing. Everything came to a stop almost. I proceeded along at a walking pace. In fact, I could have got out and walked and uh, beat the Bronco. So you might want to bring a light raincoat just in case you get caught in this. And, of course, we'll give you a little indoctrination talk on Monday morning so that you'll know all the goodies about St. John's and this part of Arizona, which most people call the White Mountain area. Don't go away. I'll be right back.
individualization is the supreme work of man. The individual, ladies and gentlemen, who has attained to the status of recognizing the divine law and who has a willingness to obey it without interfering with any others is greater than the state, greater even than the church, though subject to the laws of the state, for the state was created collectively by the individuals. Such an individual is free. Free. He is a co-worker with God because he does the will of God. He has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of his own well-being and that of those depending upon him, provided always that he does never interfere with the equal rights of others. Now let me give that to you again so that there is no question about what it means. He has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of his own well-being and that of those depending upon him provided always that he does not ever interfere with the equal rights of others. You see, man possesses neither rights nor privileges unless he is willing to be responsible for his every act. The biblical concept of the use of our talents is recognized here as absolutely 100% correct. You see, to possess a privilege or a talent imposes the penalty of making correct use of it. Every potentiality possessed by man obligates him to bring it into manifestation for his own good and for the welfare of others. Now make no mistake about it and make sure that you understand exactly what I'm talking about. The man who correctly governs himself is in no need of being governed. The divine law, ladies and gentlemen, is for the government of man. Order is the first law. To be in harmony, man must live within the law. Legislative enactments, man-made laws are for those who refuse to obey the divine law. It's the only reason that they are necessary. It is the only reason that a legislature was ever created. Legislative enactments, man-made laws, are for those who refuse to obey the divine law. Man is not made for the law but laws are made for the proper conduct of men. In like manner, men are not the servants, the minions of either church or government, but church and government are the servants of man. Quote, By the sweat of thy brow shalt thou live. End quote. This is one of the first and greatest of the divine commands, Labor is dignity. It is noble. And it is essential if the minds and bodies of men are to be strong, healthy, and normal. Neither the world nor the government owes any normal man a living. He owes it to himself to earn a living. Not, quote, O oh Lord, give us this day our daily bread, end quote. But instead, quote, O oh Lord, give me this day the strength that I may earn my daily bread, end quote. In this there is honor, strength, and manhood, and these are the requisites to being truly in touch with your soul. Quote, by the sweat of thy brow shalt thou live, end quote, implies that every man must be given the opportunity to earn the bread he needs and that there be no restrictions placed upon him, provided he is willing to labor honestly 
and with full intent to give a fair exchange for that which he is to receive. With this, there is dignity, there is self-respect, there is honor, there is a place in the community. The human drone, on the other hand, are he who would live on the effort of others, has no more place in life than has the drone in the beehive, so long as the social order permits such infringement, there can be no social justice, and the whole of society is on an infirm basis. You see, all men are under the law to render a fair return for all they receive. He who refuses to do so when able to comply is in fact an outlaw and creates difficulties for those honestly belabored. Those who permit the evil are as guilty as those who commit the wrong. Socialism is a criminal society. Socialism claims to be righting the evils in society to create a just state for all men, when in fact they create the evil which destroys the society and renders all men slaves. As the welfare of the entire world, ladies and gentlemen, depends on the action of the individual, so does justice depend on the individuals composing society. Justice is the basis of human welfare. If society permits an individual, the church or the state, to commit an injustice, then all of society is guilty, and all of society must pay the penalty. Organized social order cannot exist long if the fundamentals underlying the structure are unjust. If one who is healthy does not work, but lives off of the efforts of another who is healthy, who does work, it is a crime. Quote, by the sweat of thy brow shalt thou live, end quote. This earliest of the divine commands does not separate men into classes. It has reference to every single living human being. It is basic because first, through physical effort, health of mind and body is maintained. Secondly, through labor, either of mind or body, something useful is accomplished. As service is rendered to the self and others, and thirdly, something is brought into creation which did not exist before, and human society is made all the richer. Thus the self is benefited and raised higher in the scale of existence, and the man so laboring and creating becomes in fact a co-worker with God. God gave man the divine law. It is the same divine law that our forefathers referenced and discussed. And this law demands obedience under penalty of losing personal identity and individuality. No man can do any greater deed than to respect the rights of his fellow men, labor to create something new and useful for the benefit of himself and others, and strive to change his personality his little, narrow, bigoted, short-sighted self into an individuality having the attributes in a minor degree, a very, very minor degree of his creator. Quote, Thou shalt not bear false witness. End quote. This great and basic commandment has been misinterpreted throughout the centuries. He who gives a promise and does not fulfill it is guilty of violating the commandment. He bears false witness against himself. He who makes a vow, takes an oath, or even gives his word of honor and fails to keep any of these is guilty of breaking this commandment. 
And that is why, to be a member of the intelligence service, you must execute an oath of allegiance. And it must be in front of a notary and so attested to by that person with his seal and signature. He who considers an agreement, an obligation, or a covenant as just a scrap of paper is guilty of breaking this commandment. Any vow, an oath, an obligation, or an agreement are sacred, and so is a man's word. He who is guilty of breaking his promise, obligation, or agreement is unfit to be a member of society. And all who knowingly accept him as one of themselves must ultimately pay the penalty for that choice. You see, not until men come to the full realization that their word must be even better than their bond could be will humanity reach its highest state of culture. The law also commands, quote, Love thy neighbor as thyself. End quote. In other words, do not do unto your neighbor that which you would not do to yourself. It's very simple. Do not do unto your neighbor that which you would not do unto yourself. Demand right dealing of yourself. Therefore, demand it of your neighbor. Don't hate yourself, even when you find yourself in error. Therefore, don't hate your neighbor if your neighbor commits an error. You should strive to so live that love, not hatred, malice, envy, or any other evil passions, be the guiding star of your life. You must recognize that at times sacrifice, the ultimate human service, will bring greater happiness than will profit or pleasure. You see, folks, love builds. It elevates and advances the individual and all races. Hate degenerates and destroys. Love is life and ends in immortality. Hate, dear listeners, is the destroyer and ends in death. We, here, form an organization of truly noblesse oblige. And that we willingly assume personal responsibility which is always a part of true greatness. We never willingly or wantingly countenance evil doing in any form, but are ever and always ready to defend justice and righteousness whenever and however we are able. I invite you to join us. Listen carefully.
Folks, again, I want to caution you to understand that I am not attacking any organization, any group of people. I'm giving you food for thought, and I hope that it is indeed food, and I hope it's palatable, and I hope that you do think upon it. When I talk about woman tonight, I'm talking about woman as woman. Not a masculine-minded and featured monstrosity allowed mouth politician tobacco-steeped in an almost unsexed creature. Not a Hillary Clinton, but a sweetheart and mother in the true sense of the much-abused word woman. An individual who thinks and has feelings is capable of performing and creating Who made woman the patient, clinging, earnest being that she is? And make no mistake about it, she is. And taking advantage of this desire, who makes her the tool and the fool of these conditions? As the man who accepted her adulation and allowed her to make a demigod of him anything to do with it, perhaps? You see, it's easy to take up Paul's characterization of, quote, silly woman, end quote. But if you just go back one verse in the same Second Timothy chapter 3 and see who it is that captures the silly woman, for verse 2 reads, quote, men shall be lovers of self, end quote, etc., in fact, read the first seven verses of this chapter and see whether the old mystic lays his indictment against women only, and you will see that this, quote, silly woman, end quote, has been taken so out of context that it cannot be applied honestly. What a grand machine the Roman Catholic Church is. How completely the minds and conceptions of the people are held to the dogmas and teachings of the church. How willingly the people seem to yield obedience to church authority. What is the secret of it all? Not always blind ignorance on the part of the devotee. It is a mark of the grossest misconception for anyone to hold that idea for a moment. For in the Catholic congregation, in that communion, are many, many bright, brilliant minds, just as there are in any Protestant congregation or Buddhist temple, or in the synagogues of Judaism. So what, then, is this subtle influence that enables the priest to hold his parish together and the bishop to rule his diocese, and the pope to control the entire church in one congruous mass, a conglomeration of incongruent material? I think not. You see, there's a deep question here that dates back to the beginning of things, or if you deny that they had a beginning to the beginning of the present arrangement, quote, Listen carefully, quote, He that made them, made them from the beginning, male and female, end quote. And whatever, whatever may have been the nature of the people of the first creation, those who lived on the earth during the period of the Elohistic creation, does not enter into the present question, for I am inclined to agree with that most often misunderstood Swedenborg's assertion that the present race cannot understand the nature and characteristics of the first race in even the smallest degree. The Catholic Church is the only church of Christendom that recognizes the feminine quality or attribute of deity and it by means of the deep hold on this mother instinct of the heart that the Roman Catholic Church maintains its influence over the minds of its devotees. 
Now, if this isn't the secret of the Roman perpetuity, what is it? For it is a power that is not to be lightly considered, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the Protestant church has set up a masculine God as an object of worship and in fact is losing its hold on the hearts of its adherents and the consequent loss of allegiance is not far off unless this church remembers. You see, had Mary remained absolutely virgin and not given birth to a Messiah, would she have ever been heard of? Would her name have been the rallying cry of millions? What does this question mean, do you ask? And I know that you're asking that. Simply this, folks. A virgin symbolizes affection for spiritual truth. But what is this affection unless it brings forth something you see, while the virgin principle claims the worship and adoration of the devotee, the mother love with its glow and warmth causes every other light to fade and lose itself in the greater effulgence. And we would have to ask whether the powerful love that finding expression in the plane of material manifestation results in motherhood does not possess a divine dignity and meaning. And does it not affect every single one of us? Was not our mother the most important person in our life during our younger years? Isn't this the easiest thing for us to identify with the motherly love? See, if we grant this point and the existence of a network of spiritual wires that encircle the affectional nature of a man as the windings of the induction coil, there must be a power that flows through the wires, and that power must be controlled by a mind that understands. And when we seek for it, don't we find that within that particular organization, the Jesuit order is the engine in the cellar, and that the Jesuit provincial is the engineer? The occult, the term used in its proper sense, practices even to the limits of magic and beyond those limits are no strange thing to the inner circles of the Catholic Church, ladies and gentlemen. For this grand religious system is old, very, very old. It undeniably runs back to apostolic times, and its earlier fathers have told enough in their writings to indicate that they not only understood, but practiced occultism. Considered that? And even in these modern times, not every master of the science has left the church fold with Eliphas Levy, the Abbe Licour, Count Guinotti, and some others who rebelled at the declaration of some dogmas and came out bringing their knowledge with them. For these were mystics, real mystics who came right out of Mother Church. If you wish evidence that there is some saintship left Left in the old church, Marie Corelli's fine book entitled The Master Christian will bring you some great enlightenment, pun intended, for it will not do to forget that the apocalyptic exploration reveals something worthy of commendation and vivification in every one of the seven churches from Ephesus to Laodicea with perhaps the balance in favor of Laodicea. Coming, ladies and gentlemen, as many practical occults did from the Catholic communion, they brought with them some of the plunder that would better have been left behind. Now, I'm not making this remark in any spirit of unkindness nor critical depreciation. I've already told you it's not the intent to attack any organization, but to give you food for thought. And I hope that you understand that. You see, in the ranks of these occult fraternities, 
there are many that I esteem. The Heliobas of Marie Corelli's Romance and Ardeth and the old master who makes a brief appearance in her Soul of Lilith. These are not imaginary characters. They have walked among us, and some of them are walking among us today. They make no outward sign. They do not strive nor cry, nor does any man hear their, quote, voice in the streets, unquote. Knowing as I do the requirements of active membership in some of these fraternities and recognizing also the fact of human limitations, I believe it is impossible for a man to remain in active connection with a genuine arcane fraternity and be a completely bad man at heart. I believe that all of these people, genuinely within themselves, think that they are doing the best that they can for mankind. One may even deny, betray, forsake his master, and still not entirely sever the cord of love by which that same master will someday draw him back. You see, I sincerely believe that absolute perfection exists in this world in some people's imagination, but never in any person. We must strive for that, always. But we must realize that the human condition forbids it. And this absolute perfection does not come into close contact with the world at large. Our angels wear coats of skin. When they divest themselves of these coverings, they leave this realm of the visible altogether. We question if the world has the slightest idea of what it really owes to the silent spiritual work of many people since at least the mid-century of the 1800s. But every movement in this world, whether physical, psychical, or spiritual, reaches a danger point at some period of its history. Arkan's wedge of gold and mantle of Shinar may work evil in Israel, working along occult lines that has temptations. And when one gains control of the psychic plane of the human race and acquires the power of shaping thoughts and actions, Ladies and gentlemen, the temptation to use that power and control selfishly is likely to be too strong for the average man. A Christ may turn his back on the offer of universal dominion, but we are not yet Christ's. There is a palpable gap between the best man on this earth and the Master Jesus. Not all the pleadings of Joab and his captains prevailed against the determination of King David to, quote, number the people, end quote, and the occult may require many hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, maybe even billions of victims from the people to even up matters and adjust the balance to wreak their revenge on the inequities that they claim have been perpetrated against them throughout the centuries mainly by the Catholic Church. There is an old arcane maxim that I have discovered in these dusty volumes from the libraries of the initiates, and it goes like this, quote, All power is from the she side of God, end quote. All power is from the she side of God. Now, I've hinted that this acknowledgement of the mother feminine love principle in the deity is the secret power of the Catholic Church. It is even more so of the fraternity 
of the rosy cross. It is not that the rulers of the Catholic Church are overactuated by this in filling of their own souls with divine love, but that it is the divine dogma of the masses of her devotees. And Jesuitism holds the string. And a full measure of this same love that flows from the she side of God is a necessity to one or a band who would set out to elevate and reform the world with any hope of success. You see, it's not the Christos of the mystery school in one's soul that leads one to look down on struggling, suffering humanity as canile or to give a cold, hard stone to him who asks for bread. The most tender, gentle, loving master in the world would swamp himself if he stepped onto this hummock. Marie Corelli in her soul of Lilith makes for us sing a story of a deeply learned mystic whose very austerity and surface goodness attracted the people to him. And he became annoyed at their continued interruption of his devotions. He came to despise them, and he finally hid himself in a dense wilderness. But one day, being disturbed by the song of a bird that entered his hut, he killed this little thing, and immediately an angel appeared and rebuked him for slaying his messenger. And then the mystic began to see that his great regard for his own sanctity stood as an obstacle in the way of his usefulness to God and humanity, and he became a changed man. Is it the desire and aim of the arcane of our day to elevate and regenerate the human race? If so, are they working toward that end? Does the end justify the means that some of them are employing? Anyone who adventures, looks into the occult, may be a sneak thief who looks for hidden power for selfish ends, and one who is unwilling to fulfill the law by giving the life by the sacrifice of the life, by living the life, by the divine law? Does the contempt with which we regard such a one belong to the honest, though ignorant, seeker after the truth and the life? Is there an end that one would wish to attain by this means? Will this course even bring about the end that true True, good, honest people would seem to desire the uplifting and ennobling of humanity. One may gain a certain temporary power, ladies and gentlemen, by standing aloof from the world, come into touch with it only to, quote, number, end quote, number it as David did his people, The desire of the human heart is for dominion. For Babylon is not yet entirely fallen. Is it not well for the Illuminati to look within its own ranks for the evil that causes it to fail and to stand in the face of its enemies? And finding this evil after diligently searching, is it not well to make a holocaust of the plunder and everything connected with it? How can you have a secret organization working for the benefit of all mankind and say that the end justifies the means and bring about wars and death and suffering and create situations which eliminates freedom from the grasp of the common man? Was it not you behind those walls without windows who first uttered the words liberty, equality, fraternity. What has happened to you? 
It's difficult to understand the contempt with which good people seem to regard you when you believe that you are doing good. And I believe that that is what you believe, for I've studied you probably more than any living person on this earth outside of your shadowy halls of power. And it is difficult to understand the contempt with which your mystic orders seem to regard women woman, if you will, and all that she represents. You say one thing to the people, and yet I watch you and your women follow dutifully three steps behind with a smile on their face, never saying anything that came from their own thoughts. And in view of the fact that it was the feminine in the master's nature that drew all to him in a loving, undoubting trust, this slighting, belittling estimation of woman is a manifestation of illuminism that is inexplicable. It manifests itself also in Jesuitism and from the halls of most of the organized religions upon the face of this earth, and it is wrong. It is wrong. And I must qualify that statement. The Pharisee and Sadducee elements were not attracted to the Master Jesus. They would spurn the woman who washed his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, but he did not. He did not. I've explained to you before Most who call themselves Christian, and most Christian churches, indeed most churches of any kind, do not practice what the original teachers of that religion set out for them to follow. Jesus would be so disappointed with the majority of the so-called Christian churches in this world, and I believe that it's been split into over a thousand schisms and sects and churches and branches and all of them are equally guilty for they hold woman literally in bondage Jesus accepted everyone who came to him isn't it claimed by many that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute Was she really a prostitute? I don't really know. But it's very clear in the Scriptures that she was not welcome outside that little group of disciples. Were not many of Jesus' followers the lower echelon of society? Did he not stop alongside the road and talk to anyone and everyone who came along? Have you read the story of the woman who offered him water at the well? Perhaps, formally, a woman in her cramped, distorted position may have shown a clinging, longing, intensely desiring tendency which clutches at whatever extends to her a hope of deliverance from her bondage, and she may extend this desire to her teacher. So that poor, despised woman following the Nazarene into the Pharisee's home, and in reply to the criticism of the sanctimonious host, he said, quote, 
For in that she cast this ointment upon my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. End quote. And when a man is slowly working himself free from his inherent evils and coming to the last grand passion through which he lays them down forever, who is it that senses the meaning of the price that he pays? Some man? Some man? They all forsook him and fled. Peter denied him three times on that night. Only woman stood by him from the beginning to the end. Only woman stood by him from the beginning to the end. And when the struggle between the man and the angel comes on in the human soul, it is only woman who understands. When I was in great need and alone, Annie came to me. Her understanding and her loyalty has taught me more than any other person living upon the face of this earth. When she was working to her very capacity, and I was strained in mine, and I needed someone desperately to assist me in this great quest that I have set for myself, in this great task, who came? Who was it that came to help me? It was a woman. It was Carolyn Nelson. And she's still here. Under the workload. Fielding all the telephone calls. Answering all the questions. Putting up with my... Absolute need for near perfection in everything. And sometimes my temper when I don't get it. Who is it that warms your hearth and keeps your home? Who is it that puts up with your inadequacies? Who is it that teaches all of us men gentleness? Who is it that slows us down? Who is it that causes us to rest when we would not, but we need rest so very badly? But woman. Who is it that bears our children in pain? Who is it that stands with us through thick or thin? Who is it that when no one else in this world understands us, our cares, causes us to lay our heads upon her breast and understands from the depth of her soul and gives to us an empathy that we can find nowhere else but woman? Men and women are different. Men and women provide different things to each other that are absolutely necessary for life within each and every one of us. Woman needs man. 
Man needs woman. Nothing will ever change that. No philosophy of political correctness. No new world order. No church. No government. No force upon the face of this earth will ever change that. Every man who does not have a woman spends 95% of his time looking for one. And God help the woman if he finds one. 95% of all women spend 95% of their time looking for the right man. But I'm here to tell you, folks, from my experience in my own life, if you marry a man before he is at least at the age of 36, you're asking for big trouble. For we just don't seem to get it all together until around that time. I shudder to think what this world would be like without woman. I believe sincerely in my heart that it is woman that civilized man. I believe that without the need of the woman for security, during the time that she is bearing the child, there would never have been a first city. Think about that. I want you all to think about that and for all the women who have been in my life in any capacity. I thank you from the deepest depths of my heart. And I hope sincerely. Sincerely, ladies and gentlemen, that they never, ever leave, that they never ever leave my realm, for I need you, and you have given me more than I could ever discover on my own. And to tell you quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I could never do this job that some higher power has bestowed upon me to perform without the women in my life. And that includes my little poo. Good night, folks, and God bless you all. I need now a